Um, you might have heard it said about the Bible. Um, nowadays, you, people don't carry around their physical Bibles as much. We carry around our Bibles in our Bible apps, and I do so as well, and it's very convenient to do so. Uh, but like, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the Bible. For instance, someone might say, the Bible is a rule book. It's full of do's and don'ts about how to live your life. They wouldn't be wrong, but they wouldn't be right. Others would say the Bible is a love letter. It's God telling us he loves us. And I would argue that that wouldn't be wrong, but that wouldn't be right either. Because the Bible is God's word revealing the love of God and the holiness of God. That the way to look at the Bible is not as just a merely a love letter. If you want to use it as a love letter, you can use the word. It's a covenantal love letter. The idea of a covenant. The Old Testament, you could all call it the Old Covenant, the New Testament, the New Covenant. The Bible lays out a relationship with God that has conditions, that has do's and don'ts. Some of it unconditional, some of it conditional. And we need to know the difference, nature to it, but that in the Bible is the word of God that teaches us how we may enter into a covenantal relationship with God. It is a book about a relationship with God, a love relationship. But the idea of the covenant, it is rooted not in just an emotional love, it is rooted in God's hesed love, the whole Hebrew word for faithful love. God is faithful to his promises and God has laid down his law. And we are not saved by the law. We are saved by grace apart from the law. But when we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, this has implications for our life. And Romans 12 lays out for us a do and don't. Don't do this and do this in light of the gospel of grace. And summarizing the Christian life, which is a life of a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, a life, the normal Christian life, which is to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, not to live half-heartedly, that the normal Christian life is not the average Christian life, it is a life of radical dependence upon God. Radical obedience In chapter, chapter 12, verse 2, it gives us the don'ts and the do's. Actually, there's a lot of exhortation that's going to come after this, and it's summarized in this. Do not be conformed to this world. That's the don't. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's the, the do. Do be transformed by the renewal of your minds and the result that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. There's so much in this one little verse that I wanted to have a whole sermon just based on this one verse. And it's outlined into three parts. It's what does it mean? to not be conformed to this world. My second part will be, what does it mean to be transformed by the renewal of your mind? And thirdly, what is the result that comes from it? And then I'm going to give a personal application. First, what does it mean to not be conformed to this world? The word conform there 
And, you know, if you, if you kind of see those two words, conform, transform, it's, there's a similar root word. It's not, the root is not evident in the, in the Greek. The Greek is two different kinds of words. But the English, it kind of lays out nicely, conform and transform. But these are very two di- very different kind of words. In one sense, they're same in the sense they're something that's done to us. It's not something actually even active. It's like, don't do something active. It's, it's an actually, don't let something be done to you and let something be done to you. And it's two very different things. Conformed, there is a sort of a paraphrased translation of the Bible written by, uh, I think his name is J.B. Phillips. There's a, something called the Phillips Bible translation, and sometimes commentators will refer to this because it makes some interesting translations that helps to understand. And his translation of this verse is, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. The NIV is, uh, uh, don't, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. The idea of conforming is like that you are mushed into a shape, a pattern, a mold. And the world has a pattern or mold, and then it's, it says here, don't be squeezed into this mold, into this pattern. So the idea is that uh, by certain actions, you know, it's, it's really reflective of Psalm 1, is that do not walk in the counsel of the wicked, don't listen to the false advice of this, the wicked people and don't walk in the way of sinners and don't sit in the seat of scoffers. So there's this progression of sin where you start to listen and then you start to do and then you start to be the sinner sitting in their presence. And so the idea here is very much conforming is the actions leading to your ontology, who you are. Ontology is a you know, fancy word for being, this understanding being, the nature of who you are, what something is. So the outside in, so in a sense, the law is like that. You obey outwardly so that inwardly something might happen. So outside in, conforming is something that's happening to you outside and it changes you on the inside. So peer pressure, you go into peer pressure and you might go do stuff and you might not feel like, oh, that, that's not really me, but I'll, you just kind of do stuff. And then before you know it, you are what you're doing. You've been conformed. The outside has changed your inside, your outside behavior. And it says here, do not be conformed to this world. And this world, in some translations, it translated this age because there are a few different words in the Greek that could, that could be used for the, the word, English word, world. Um, cosmos is one, one word that sometimes, for God so loved the cosmos. But here it's the word that, uh, where we get the word eon from. And so this age, some people, some translators will translate it this age. But this age, what does it mean, this age? It's... It's not just a kind of era or period of time. It's, it's really, it is talking about the world, this world, or the spirit of this world. So this world, um, we just heard a message this morning from Lloyd Kim in, in the missions conference about, for God so loved the world. So how does, you know, but in the, in the Gospel of John and in the, the letter of John, it says, uh, do not love the world. God so loved the world, but don't, don't be of the world. Don't love the world. Be in the world, but you are in the world, but not of the world. So how, do we, how are we to understand this word, world? Are we to love the world, or are we to be against the world? And here it says, do not be conformed to this world. So what, we have to understand what this word world means. And, and it could mean a lot of things, but there are three distinct meanings to the word world in Scripture. Probably more, but these three are very clearly pronounced. And you can interpret 
uh, different passages based on which, what it's meaning. First, the world is the created world. This is my father's world. Right? The Global Missions Conference, those of you who are there, we, we sang that song this morning. This is my father's world. God made this world and it was good. This world, this created world, you go, some of you, I'm, I'm not an outdoorsy person, my wife is. <laughs> you know, if you like to go on hikes and you go to the mountains and uh, you use streams, you know, I, I like it, you know, but then I'll take only five minute hike. <laughs> you know, some people can spend hours upon hours just doing that and just enjoying nature. I'm not one of them. You know, I can sit in front of the TV for hours and hours, <laughs> but uh, nature, I appreciate it, but some of you are more into nature than I am. My wife certainly is. But it's an appreciation for the created world. Yes, this created world is also a fallen world. That's why we have the disasters that we have. It's a fallen world that we live in. But it still bears the mark of the beauty of the creator. This created world that we live in that we should appreciate, we can delight in. We could be afraid of the devastation of it, but we also know that God made it, and it was good, and it should point us to him. Another use of the world is the people of the world and the peoples of the world. And you can put in, a post, you know, the, in parenthesis an S, the people of the world, so every single person of the world, as, and the peoples of the world, the people groups of the world, for God so loved the world, is this sense of the word. The people and the peoples of the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. The peoples of the world. The people of the world. This is not, when Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, he's not saying, get away from people. Or don't be like other, the worldly people. Don't, so, you know, uh, should we dress like monks, be different from the world? It's the third use of the world when it's used in the negative. Not the created world, not the peoples of the world, but the sinful, if you're filling in the blanks, it's the sinful system of the world. Now, if you know anything about my politics, I'm not into uh, a lot of the liberal ideologies out there today, you know, particularly in regards to understanding about uh, systemic things that are going on in our culture, and people might speak about that. But you know, there is something systemic in our world the Bible speaks about. It's the system of sin. The sinful system of the world that the Bible uses the word flesh. Flesh is not the created flesh. It is the sinful system, sinful nature. And all the systemic evils that we might point to in our culture, in our society, is rooted in this Sinful system. What's the problem with the world? It's sin. Vadi Vakam, where I got some of this outline from, he quotes it this way, the sinful system of the world, the world that cultivates the sinful nature and ultimately does the bidding of the devil. That's the sinful system of the world. 
And Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world. What is this world? It is the sinful system of the world. That the NIV says is the pattern of this world. Or in other translations, it will use, Do not be conformed to this age. The spirit of this age. And what uh, people in using the Greek, uh, German language, zeitgeist, the ghost of this age, this time. The sinful patterns that we see in this world. And uh, how does Romans lay out the sinful pattern? If you turn back to Romans chapter 1, it actually lays it out pretty clearly in the beginning of the book of Romans. In the beginning of the book of Romans, Paul actually lays out very clearly what he, what he thinks, I would say, is the system of sin. And in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, he says, after he had just stated his thesis that in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. For faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And he's about to explain what this means, the righteousness of God by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we are saved by faith in Christ alone. And he lays out for a chapter and a half, you know, part of chapter one, all of chapter two, and part of chapter three, he lays out for us sin. The sinful system of the world. Number one, verse 18 to 23, is the rejection of the truth about God, the truth of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse." For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men, birds and animals, and creeping things. They rejected the truth of God, not only in atheism, but in idolatry in false worship, looking for something visible, something tangible, rather than something that they could relate to, to make God in their own image or in the image of things that they see around, rather than submitting and acknowledging to the truth of the God who made everything. They made gods in their own image. The pattern of this world, they took the God who made them and did, you know, as someone said, return the favor by making God in their, their image. They wanted a God that was user-friendly. Someone who would do their bidding so the first pattern of this world is the rejection of the truth about God. And as a result of the rejection of the truth about God, every other sin comes from that. I mean, isn't that's what Adam and Eve, the sin was not merely eating, the, eating a fruit. God, what, why, why all this stuff, all this sin happens because of someone ate a fruit? It wasn't about the fruit. The fruit was the knowledge of good and evil. Who gets to determine what is right and wrong? Who is the authority in your life? And parents, especially parents of children under five, particularly under five, 
the most important thing you can teach them that your child is a creature under God's authority. Don't let your child think they are the master of this world. They are a creature under God's authority. It is so important to lay down. When we think we are the authority, we are the one who ultimately determines right and wrong, all other sins flow from this, the rejection of the truth of God. Paul lays out what follows. Therefore God gave them up into the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creature, creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women, exchanged natural relations for those that were contrary to nature, and men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. This isn't just merely trying to point out homosexuality as the greatest sin or something, it's, but it is this, the sin that represents something against the nature of God. It is not the only sin. It is not the greatest sin. Sexual immorality, adultery, lust, greed, pride, anger, unjustified anger are all sins. But this is pointed out as an example. It's a symptom of the rejection of the truth about God. And we see this as a pattern of this world. And this is not just about pointing out homosexuality. It's, but it's, it's in this sin where submitting to God's ways or submitting to, I want to do whatever I feel. I am the master of my life. I will determine what right and wrong is. What is right and wrong? Whatever I feel. Now, if you look at our cultural sins today, the things that we struggle with, it is at heart this thing. I will determine what right and wrong is, and I will not submit to God's ways, the truth about God. So having been filled with the lust of our hearts, not only in homosexuality, but in all other kinds of sexual sins. It says in verse 28 and following, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind, not only the lust of their hearts, but now a debased mind, to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, sinful or strife and deceit and maliceness, maliciousness, sorry. They were gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Children, let me say that again. Disobedient to parents. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decrees and those who practice such things deserve to die, not only do them, but gave approval to those who practice them. This is the debased mind rejecting the truth about God in the lust of their hearts and giving over to their passions, being led by their passion, and their passions have corrupted their minds. When you let your passions rule you, your minds 
no matter how smart you think you are, your mind will become wasted. And we see that today, just people given over to the lust of their passions and their thinking is corrupt. Thinking they are wise, they become foolish. But lest we Christians who live in our own eyes decent lives, you know, and we would consider maybe this, oh yeah, those people. In chapter 2, Paul does not let off the hook, those people who live a religious life and don't look like they are part of the, the degenerate people of this world. Paul does not let them off the hook either and says, Therefore you have no excuse, O men, every one of you who judges. So don't stand in judgment of others. For in passing judgment of another, you condemn yourself because you judge, but you practice the very same thing. And for us, our sin is not a different kind. It's just a different degree. For we struggle with lust and anger and all these things. And it might not be to the same degree, but it's the same nature. Same nature. And Romans 3.23 summarizes all this, that it includes every single one. No one is without excuse. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that is why we need the gospel. Every single one of us. Be not conformed to the pattern of this world. The pattern of rejection of the truth of God. The pattern of lust of their hearts leading them. Leading to a debased mind filled with all manner of unrighteousness. And be careful of anger. Brothers and sisters, you'll be amazed how anger can come from the unlikely sources. Not in fits of rage, but sometimes through depression. You look at the world and you get frustrated and you get depressed. And before you know it, it becomes anger in your soul. This is the pattern of this world. Paul says, be not conformed to the pattern of this world. How? Well, he doesn't really go over the how right here. But it's something being done to you. So be not conformed means just don't sit there. You know, if something is something's trying to mold you, don't just, oh, I, I can't help it. You got to get out of there. <laughs> but then what do we do? Don't get conformed to this world. Then what do we do? Okay, let's look for conformity to something good. Let's go to the monastery and have everybody dress the same and everybody shave their heads and Let's conform to something good. Everybody look the same on the outside. You know, there's always a desire in religious orders to do this. The world is bad. Let's get away from the world and let's have our own little place where we have our own conformity. Everybody dresses the same. Everybody acts the same. Everybody has a certain set of actions you notice here, he doesn't say, do not be conformed to this world, be conformed to the Christian stuff. Because Christianity is not in conforming outside in. It is transforming inside out. 
transformation is inside out. It's something that happens inside you, making a difference in your outside, not changing the outside, hoping that the inside will change. It's not conformity. It's transformity. (laughs) That's a bad word. Transformation. To be transformed, and the word in the Greek is actually the word metamorphosis, where we get the word metamorphosis, the same root word, transformed like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Caterpillar can't make itself to it, it just kind of happens because that's who the caterpillar is. It's a butterfly hidden, looking like an ugly worm. Turning into a beautiful butterfly. Whereas conforming is do so you can be outside in. Transformation is be. Be a Christian. Be a gospel person. By embracing the gospel, be. And when you are... You will do. Inside out. Transformation is inside out. The renewal of your minds. Let me read you a couple of verses uh, from uh, Romans and Galatians. In Romans chapter 5, or Romans chapter 8, verse 5, which talks about something very similar to the renewal of your minds. Let me read for you. For those who live according to the flesh or sinful nature, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh But in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. And the whole point of chapter 8 is, but you belong to Him. The Spirit of God dwells in you. And it is the Spirit of God that renews your mind and renews your heart. It is by the Spirit of God that transforms you. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 list the fruit of the Spirit. Hopefully many of you have this memorized already. I haven't memorized, but just so I don't make a mistake, I'll read it from the Bible. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It's related to 1 Corinthians 13. Patience and kindness. What is love? Love is patient and kind. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And you notice here that it lays these out. And in the ESV, it doesn't use the word and. And is listed in the singular. The fruit of the Spirit is. Not the fruits it is the fruit is singular with no ands because all of these things are together. The renewal of your minds comes by the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit work? It works in wherever He wishes. The Spirit works in many different ways, but the most common way, I would say, he works in and through the Word of God. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is never jealous of Jesus. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I've heard preachers in charismatic circles sometimes say, you know, you've heard a lot about Jesus, but we've got to talk about the Holy Spirit. 
Almost like setting aside Jesus to talk about the Spirit. Oh, the Spirit is never in competition with Jesus Christ. And if anyone talks about the Holy Spirit without talking about Jesus, I would tell you that they are most likely going to misunderstand the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's purpose is to bring you into a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done for you. That's his main purpose. That's why the Holy Spirit comes after Jesus finished his work. And Holy Spirit is in everything in one sense, but the Holy Spirit's work, the person of the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit comes after Christ's accomplished work. The Spirit applies the work of God that is finished in Jesus Christ. Someone said this, and I'm including this in my sermon, but the relationship with the Word and the Spirit is very important. So for Presbyterians, we might have the Word of God, but sometimes we might not really really have a strong emphasis on the Spirit of God. Though John Calvin, who is the theologian of the Reformation, who was known for deep and God-centered theology, but in his um, institutes, he was known as a theologian of the Holy Spirit. He emphasized the Holy Spirit a lot. His main thing, though, was that the Holy Spirit's working in, in and through the Word and illuminating our hearts through the Word, bringing us into the, the work of Jesus Christ. So, uh, this is not what John Calvin said, but some preacher said this, and I've copied it many times. It says, if you have the word of God without the spirit of God, you dry up. You get dry. If you have the spirit of God without the word of God, you blow up. <laughs> but if you have the word of God and the spirit of God, you grow up. I like the blow up part. <laughs> um, and you know, those are based on some caricatures of things, but you get what I'm trying to say that the Word of God and the Spirit of God are not two things to be pitted against each other. Oh, I had enough of the Bible. Now I need the Holy Spirit. It's both. This is the Word of God. How is this inspired? inspired by the Holy Spirit. When the preacher prays, what is he praying? He's praying for illumination. Not inspiration, but illumination, that God would shine his light on the word that is here. Who does that? It is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and the word together Renewing our minds. If you have trouble with Bible reading, I would say this simple prayer. Lord, I humble myself before you. Holy Spirit, help me to understand. I have a lot of seminary learning and training and so forth. But the principle of interpretation of the Bible, when I can sincerely do that, Lord, I humble myself before you. Holy Spirit, help me. I learn more from the Bible than any other time. What is the result of a transformed mind, the renewal of our minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, the will that is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, I kind of remember this verse in the NIV that I used for many, many years in my younger years of ministry. What is good, 
the NIV has pleasing and perfect. And I do like that word, pleasing. Acceptable in the sense of pleasing. And the idea there is that God's will is good. But you can say, oh, something is good, but it's like, oh, eating broccoli is good and you know, eating, doing some things that you don't like to do is good, but pleasing is not just, it's not just good, it's really good. But it's not just really good, it is perfect. God's will is perfect. And the, why we need the renewing of our minds is that, that so that we can understand God's will for us. And one of the things about being conformed to this world is that when you conform to this world and when, you, when, you, when you're following the pattern of this world, it's that you will think God's ways are not very good. You'll always question, oh, is that the right way, God? And you see things happening in this world, and you'll always question God's goodness. And I'm not talking about just in terms of philosophical questions about suffering in this world and so forth, but things that happen in your life personally. And if I can end, I need to wrap this up real quick. But when I dedicated my life to Christ, and I went through a few periods where I sort of dedicated my life to Christ. When I was a 13-year-old in a summer retreat, I had a, one of those altar call moments. Uh, but after that, I went through a roller coaster ride and ups and downs and went through high school and periods of rejecting my background and my experience. But in my senior year in college was when I came to really, you know, if you want to say really commit to the Lord, <laughs> uh, even though we'll do that until the day we die. But I, had, I did have those moments where God really spoke to me. And it was a simple realization of two truths. And the truth was that, or the lie was, I had believed that if I commit my life to God, if I submit to God, my life would be miserable. And the reason why I thought that was, uh, you know, most of my friends were non-Christian at the time. And so I wouldn't be able to hang around with my friends they wouldn't like me if I committed my life to Christ. And so I felt like I would be ostracized by my friends in the kind of the world that I lived in. And, you know, that... Um, so I did not think God's will, what I thought was God's will for my life, was good, acceptable, good, pleasing, or perfect by any means. But as I really came to my own sense of understanding of where I was, where I did not, even as I was going away from God, how miserable actually my life became inside, deep inside. And I discovered two truths. It was just simple things that I already knew. One is, God is able to do what's best for me. God is God. His power. God is able to do what's best for me. If God is able to do what's best for me, why don't I trust him? Well, maybe he doesn't really want what's best for me. Yeah, of course, God is God and he's able to do what's best for me. But does he really want what's best for me? Well, you know, I mean, it's it's a very self-centered question. It's not a great Calvinist question. You know, it should be God-centered and Godward. But bear with me a little bit. But God did meet me where I was in the, in the sense of, wow, 
of course, God does all things for his glory, but that doesn't mean it excludes our good. And when I realize God wants the best for me, it's a simple truth, right? God loves me. But those two things, God is powerful and is able to do what's best for me, and God loves me and he wants what's best for me. If those two things are true, I'm a logical person, and it was like reasonable act of worship. It is stupid for you not to trust in God. If God is able to do what's best for you and wants the best for you, you are stupid <laughs> if you don't trust in God. That's the conclusion I came to. And it wasn't necessarily it happened one day, it happened over two months, but it led to me getting down on my knees in my dorm room and lifting my hands up to the sky and saying, Lord, here I am. I'm yours. Surrendering my life to God. Your will be done. Your will is good, pleasing, and perfect. And I can tell you, it was freedom, peace, and joy flooding my heart. God's will <clears throat> is good, acceptable, and perfect. And when God transforms your life, transforms your mind, he lets you be able to see that. Let me close in prayer.